some of the uh, information you might want. So we'll be dealing with some of the data analyzed with the latest QCD data. So I'll just give you some very brief intro and later on you will have a lecture that will go do some more details on some of these subjects. Right, so just, uh, whoops. <laughs> Okay, so just a little bit about me. Um, um, I my preferred pronoun is she, her, her. I got my bachelor degree in Taiwan, so it's one of the small country next to China. It's not part of China, but it's its own country. And I got my PhD at Columbia University. That is the one in New York City. And since I live, I since the New York City, I've been living in pretty much a lot of places in in the U.S. I've been to Virginia, Seattle, and I live in the Bay Area for the while New. Apple actually, just two blocks away from the Apple. And then and then I moved to uh, Michigan, which is like the, the only the Midwest place I actually ever lived in throughout the, the whole time in US. I'm currently assistant professor at Michigan State, and I actually have a joint appointment in addition to the many lecture you're gonna have to everybody have a uh, thesis association. I actually also have a joint appointment with a new department. It's called Computational Math Science and Engineering. And it's kind of a really fun department. So basically we have, it's a new department that uh, the, the university put together between Natural Science College, Engineer College. And what we do is we put a lot of faculty that who have using the computational tool in their research. It could be just applied, applied mathematician, we got physics people from ice cube and astronomy simulation, et cetera, and myself, including high performance computing. And so everybody has some sort of joint appointment between this department and another department. And the goal is to really simulating a lot of interesting You will find out later on, I didn't do this school and other uh, feature meeting that there's actually quite a lot of common thing that some, there are common problem that everybody run into in different subfield, but everybody using slightly different language. So that's kind of the thing that try to interact, how get people to interact a lot more and then be able to create some of the new idea. And maybe we'll be able to take some of the solution from one field to another that can help solve some of the problems. So it's kind of interesting and new. And so, you know, a lot of people like to ask me, ask me about what the professor do. So usually you have you know, research is not, unfortunately, not the only thing I have to do. You know, uh, teaching takes a lot of time, and a lot of time we also have to do quite a bit of service as well. And so my research is mainly in the uh, particle and nuclear physics area. So it's a little bit of gray area between between both of them. And so like Joe and many other people, uh, lecturer you're gonna see in the in this summer school, uh, we use a lot of high performance com supercomputer and try to study a lot of property that we call uh, quantum coma dynamics in short QCD. And so my research is particularly focused on study the property of the quarks and the gluons. So it's basically one of those even smaller building block inside the nucleon. And, and I study the property of the nucleon and other hadrons. And my group have been also trying to apply some of the machine learning technique in some of the data analysis to try to see a, a different view of the project. So uh, if you like to know more a little bit about QCD, it's a, like I say, it's a comp complicated subject. And given this is pretty late in the afternoon, so I thought I might just kind of, if you are interested uh, to learn a little bit, there's this fun game you can do on your phone. Um, it's going to play you a little bit of the trailers. So you can, you know, you get tired of your summer school later on, you can play a little bit. It's a very sim simple game, try to teach people about how the quarks make out the protons and different hadrons that people have been actually studying them in various different experimental facilities. So, um, so in this school, you can see the schedule There's going to be a, a little bit more on the uh, different different focus of the latest field theory with different applications. Uh, so you can have some from Richard uh, and then a little bit from Chris Menaha. I'm going to tell to you more detail on the uh, latest QC by itself. And then you will have a follow up with the more in depth of the data analysis with uh, Christopher Oban. And so what I try to do, uh, we will see how this works in the in the online setup. I am trying, I'm a, a big, converter uh, of Fleet Classroom. 
And so what this does is uh, we allow students to come to the class with a few of the problem they try to think about how they're going to solve a little bit. And I think that's important, although it's not quite popular with students. I often got survey complaints. Students like to listen to professor first before they do something. But the more I work with the uh, different grade students, and I know more feel like this is really important because a lot of time in research, you often had to deal with a problem that you never we know nothing about. We had to do that multiple times as we move from one research area to another. And then, you know, it's um it's going to be very common for many of you in the future, you know, maybe near future or you know, longer future, you're going to have that ability to, you're going to run that into a field that you know nothing about. You need to read about them. You need to research about them before you even know what to do with that. So, uh, but, you know, with, with, a, with a classroom set up, we, we were not going to set the pre-class to be too hard. So there's a little bit of kind of transition to you to, to be able to do something, you know, that you know nothing about, but you get a little bit of information from video or from the instructions, and then you can do a little bit more details um, with the in-class. And with the in-class assignments, I like students to work in the group. So you're going to have a couple of students. Hopefully, we will be able to make sure that everybody has a constant group later on. And I like students to work together. And this is, again, this is another very common useful skill that a lot of places, a lot of workplaces require you to be able to work in the team, right? You need to be able to contribute individually or come, uh, be able to compare with each others and, and you work with each other that you can achieve more. And sometimes I also, also find working in the group, you actually learn a different way of solving the same problem that I don't think about it uh, initially. So that's kind of uh, three diversify how, how you think about the problems. And I think that's also a very important skill. So I'm a big fan of the fleet classroom. I'm not sure how many, so this is one of the questions I was hoping to poll. I don't know how many, I'm not sure I can do this on the spot. <laughs> I was wondering how many people actually um, take a flip classroom before? Maybe, let's see, I can redo this. Is it a Sorry, they're answering you in the chat window, actually. They're answering you in the chat. Ah. Oh, okay. Actually, quite a lot. Well, that's good. Okay, that's good. Yeah. So I, I think more and more school university having having uh, the free classroom. So yeah. So um, okay. So for those who have no idea what this is and then think about why we had to do this, is they having a lot of study. This is probably one of the very our day study that the child I borrowed from one of my colleagues. But the point is that the tra traditional just listen to lecture talking and then you do some homework problem and you don't usually get really good learning game. So the, the SSS here is the how much you learn. And then uh, so what people find, actually if I can get this to work. Okay, yeah, so if you do a, a number of economy, including things like the classrooms, you can find actually, you actually have student actually learn a lot better. And so this is one of the, um, and, I mean, the, a lot of motivation that many universities is moving forward to the free classroom. They take uh, very different forms. And, but, but in general, so it's going to be harder working for students, but, but uh, if, if, if after the class, you're supposed to know more than the knowledge you retain with you better than the just listen. You know, if you listen, you probably remember today, tomorrow, then you completely forget about it in another two days. And that's really not worth your time either. Right. So, so this is going to be different. I'm not going to do a lot of lecturing uh, throughout these two days classes. Today will be a little bit of exception. I will talk a little bit more, but then I would like to, you know, this is going to be reverse. Uh, uh, in tomorrow's class, I'm not going to talk much at all. And what I want you to do is, uh, so you, some of you already submit uh, the pre-class assignments. And so these are crucial. Uh, so we were trying to get out a, a few of the simple concepts in the pre-class assignments. And, and a lot of time when I design the free classroom, I will have something, a simpler problem you saw in the pre-class. And you can take, for example, today, in today's class, you can take the function you wrote in the pre-class and then use it in class and you do more complicated problems. And so it's important that you start that process before coming to the class. So everybody in the group will be in the same stage. And then uh, 
I also have survey, which I collect questions that will answer some of those common questions. And if you have other individual questions that did not get answered, you can email me. I will try to respond as soon as I can. And so the in class, in, in the class, which will be during this time when everybody get online. Um, so with the coding specifically, there's really, um, you really have to tie and try to pull things out yourself. There's no amount of listening going to get you in the right place or you'll be able to write any code. So it's really an on-hand experience. But I, I like to, let's see if we can do this. I like to have about three or four students work together. And hopefully you guys can, be, can share screen with each other, compare your answer and talking about your strategy among with each other. And then you can uh, also see, you know, how, how everybody do the code slightly differently. And, and so you will be doing most of the basically typing and working on things and can help also help each other debugging. Let's see. Right. So, so today's exception, I'm going to talk a little bit more than I usually would. Um, let's see. Right. Um, so I just want to remind people very importantly uh, in the class that a lot of students tend to freak out if you find someone else work on the problem differently from you do, or maybe I show an example of how I do the code and they tend to freak out like, no, 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 I'm not doing the same way. It's totally okay. There's more than one way of doing, solving the problem. So just because you do things differently, it doesn't mean it's wrong. So please don't freak out if you, you see, you know, your group mate was, do you, maybe you have a, you were in the four people group and, you are the only person who's, you know, approach the problem differently. That's okay. There's, there's no need to freak out. There's no really, uh, uh, at this stage, there's no really a uh, big way of doing things. It's just different and that's okay. And you should be able to also, I hope you, you will be also learn to express yourself about, you know, what you're thinking behind how you do certain problems and then can compare that. Maybe there are actually better way to solve the problem and maybe not. And you can kind of compare that. And I mentioned that in the real world place, this is a, a working with other people. It's a very important skill. Be able to explain your thinking and how you approach the certain problem, why you think this is a good or wrong. And that's a very important skill to have as well. So I hope you can, uh, even though you can probably take a notebook and do, do this in your own time. But I think when you are in the school, you should really, human is a very important resources as well. And I hope you guys will be able to take advantage of that while everybody is in school at this time, you know, try to get as much out as possible. And I know a lot of students actually made a lot of lifetime friends when they were in you know, summer school uh, because they do a lot of problems together. They spend a lot of time talking to each other. They become a long, even longer term friend than some of those uh, classmates they went to grade school together, but so you never know. Okay. So, so I, I like everybody to uh, maybe, uh, I don't know how many of you know each other already. And also, I don't know whether we can do this, but ideally I like people to form about three to four uh, people in the subgroup. And then, so, so Paul is gonna help me with this. <laughs> and then, so when we do that, I like you to spend a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes also to introduce yourself with other students. It would be great if you, you, you are in the group that with a student that you don't know, you get to know new friends. And I want you to talk a little bit about, you know, yourself, how you pronounce your name, what's your preferred pronouns, and, you know, what's your current major. We have quite diverse uh, background of the summer school student here, I think. And then maybe talk about something about maybe just, you know, we all are this breakdown and stay home uh, situation, but maybe there's something that's positive that happened to you of somebody you know during this time. I think that would be some nice positive idea to share with. All right, so we're gonna pause here a little bit and then um, then we will come back and talk about today's plan after this. So uh, Paul, do you want to take over and see how we can do this? Yeah, sure, let me, let me stop the recording real quick. Something called quantum coma dynamics. Uh, that's uh, the real name is. You can also, some people like to call it like color force and a set of strong into strong force. And it's strong in a way that it basically binds. So we know the smallest particle that we find uh, inside the building block hadrons are the quads and gluon, and they are actually confined inside that you cannot. You can, sorry. Uh, 
So you cannot actually break them apart as you try to put them apart, the force becomes stronger, we'll bind them together. And this is having, it's nothing new, it's actually been around for a while, and we actually know uh, a lot of physics at a high energy end, because the if you look at the uh, uh, the one way to tell how strong the force is, you look at the uh, coupling constant, and for strong force, we have alpha as for strong, it's a function of the energy for Q, and then you go smaller and you go to larger um, energy, so we can, actually we can do a lot of perturbation calculations similar to an um, if you take in field theory that you probably work a lot of, of QED field theory examples that you can actually work out one loop or two loop calculation. Three loop, you probably need special or tool to do that. And these three gentlemen actually study a lot of this behavior and take on the Nobel Prize in 2004. But at the low energy, that's still a lot of, uh, or a lot of strong interaction regimes. And that's where this QCD really come in and be able to contribute because the standard you know, tight expansion like a uh, typical what we call perturbation calculation doesn't quite work as well anymore. And you really need to be able to uh, take into account all this very complicated phenomena in these regions. And there's actually a lot of interesting things you can do. Uh, so this is my, um, so uh, so this, uh, this is my personal version of motivation about why we care about all this strong interaction at this uh, small energy. So my personal, uh, I do a lot uh, currently is to study the structure inside the nucleon, right? So we have a nucleon, we know we have quarks and gluon inside, but the structure of them is literally quite complicated. And and because we do a lot of experiment today regarding if you are talking about experiment and large hydron collider to some of those desktop neutron beta decay, you just put a bunch of very, very cold neutron and waiting layer for it to kind of decay to proton and study a bunch of its behavior. And they all connected to something with the nucleon. And so be able to really narrow down the property of this, actually help you not just understand this, the model itself, but also help you to set the standard model background. And then people can just can study whether they actually see new physics or they are seeing the same physics you already know of. And another uh, something I did before, before is you, if you put a bunch of nuclei and put them together, that forms nuclei that you know uh, sitting inside uh, the center of the atoms. And you might wondering, you know, you can understand, try to, this is all residual interaction of the strong force. And so how do certain nuclei exist? Why does certain nuclei doesn't exist in nature? And why are some of them, you know, uh, there's a, why does element we saw, that's the only, that's the only stable combination, et cetera. And so if you read, this is again, the big research fields, and there have been some latest study, or they are a uh, latest study try to study a small nuclear system. And they are also a wide range of field. People use different uh, methods try to study this to from very small nuclei to very large nuclei. And they have wide range of applications. And but you also have a very interesting astronomical uh, application. So we study something is very, very small in the Fermi, I mean, on scale, 10 to the minus 15 meter or smaller. And we actually got this very nice, uh, a lot of applications. So one of the uh, interesting applications people like to study is the neutron star. And it's basically a compact, this is a bunch of neutron all packing together. And they have very weird behavior because the matter is so dense, it behaves very differently than the free neutron we see in the real world. And there were a lot of predictions. So they are very super interesting. They, uh, you can determine the equation of state. So there's a certain mass and the radius a neutron star can form. And it also depends on they are the center of the neutron star could have very strange behavior. So things that doesn't exist in our real world, uh, things like hyperon, which is a nucleon with one of the strange quarks replaced the nucleon, for example, could live much longer inside the center of the star and then have a very different equation of state Then you see a wide range of the mass and radius distribution and so on. So there's a really wide range of that uh, thing that actually associate that and how neutron star in, uh, become um, interact with each other and form those gravitation waves, which is very popular today. There are people also, you know, try to make those connections, etc. So this is a, a, a really wide range of the application that QCD it can apply to, and I can mess up this. And so, so the problem is when you study the low energy, and even the Q, just to think about the vacuum, it's it's not easy to describe them in the classical. In 
the classical world, right, vacuum is really just nothing, right? So we think about space, we often, people often talk about it as nothing. But if you really look down to the small scale, the, the QCD scales, the vacuum is not nothing. Vacuum is a very dynamical changing. The quark can appear and disappear. Many times you can have different kind of topological the gluon and there's actually a constant interaction that's changing and changing. So just to describe the, the basic fundamental, the Guang state, it, it's not an easy job to do. And so this is really coming and um, why, why we are doing the latest QCD. Um, so instead of doing the perturbative kind of description that this is really difficult to imagine, you can capture all those uh, very complicated uh, Q, the QCD background by itself. So what we do is we 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 actually take a process, you know, depends on what kind of particular process you are interested in. Uh, we, we do the uh, path integral, like what you heard about in like similar to Feynman diagrams, but in the field of theory formulations. And we write code to actually try to calculate that and move into machine. So often we had to do a larger scale machine to do a realistic problems. And so, so that's latest QCD. Uh, so it's an idea tool to study some of these uh, strong uh, coupling problems of the quantum field theories. And um, so if you know how to solve the problems, you can write down the path integral, you can write down the, uh, what you need to do so you can, and you have your gluon, gluon and quark field, everything is in terms of field now. And you can write down the operator corresponding to the specific quantum number you have, then you can actually calculate the observables that could be what people directly see in the experiment or can be uh, indirectly extracted from experiments. And we do this in Euclidean space because now everything is real. We don't have to worry about measuring number. And so one, so here is a cartoon for a uh, full, so we are actually doing the four dimensional space time simulations. And so they are just a 3D version because I don't know how to draw for these. And then you, in this case, basically we will try to we discretize space time. So everything is moving, can all like a robot, it can only move, you can only do certain move. You cannot move anywhere you want, like the continuum. So the rotational symmetry is breaking a little bit. And if, and the gluon field we're living on this link, we just have have uh, kind of embedded the information layer. So to simplify our calculations. And we have a, a short, shortest distance that are going to determine our resolution. And we need to make sure that this, this distance does not affect the answer that we are seeking. So we have usually had to do a couple of this study and or, or even take the latest space into zero limit. So you get finer and finer, let's get to the real world. And we also need to make sure the box itself. So we have, we only have limited computation time, so we cannot simulate infinite, you know, real world with infinite degree of freedom. So you have to have a cutoff. You just need to kind of make sure that your box is big enough, it's not squeezing the physics. And again, so you want the box to be as large as possible. And then uh, often time people are putting quad masses on the latest calculation much heavier than the physical ones. And at the end of the day, you kind of just have to re remove that. Uh, either directly calculate the the uh, physical power mass, or you do an extrapolation, then you can get the real quantity you can compare with the continuing experiments. So this has been around for quite a while. Um, so the idea has been proposed in the late 70s by Wilson. And but you know, it was really exciting at the time. A lot of people expect we're going to stop QCD anytime soon. Uh, but there is a, in, in, for a long time, the progress of latest QD have been limited to uh, computational resources. And just to give you an idea, this is a uh, state of the art computer game that one can play. Um, you know, very probably a computer that's bigger than the decks that you, you have today. And it's a very, uh, that's the state of the art computer can handle. And to today, everybody has this tiny little SPS or some other devices that your phone can probably handle way more than the uh, other computer combined. So there's a big uh, progress by the computational hardware advances that we are actually be able to do a lot more exciting calculation now than many of our um, you know, uh, professor back in the time, what they can do. And another thing that's happening really actively, I think this is also probably uh, uh, related to the school, is we actually have a lot of interactions with the people outside the physics field. A lot of people work with uh, 
uh, com computer scientists uh, or the applied mathematicians, and there are a lot of interesting uh, algorithm that's bring into the community that a lot of people can take advantage of, including myself. Right, so so this is a but the field by itself is really a community effort in, in many ways. You don't sometimes you, you really take advantage of all what other people spend their maybe a, a PhD student that spend the whole time optimizing a specific routine that can give us a 10 times. So a calculation might take one year, now a 10 year before, now you can finish in one year. So you can do a lot more uh, than what you can. And it is really building upon um, a lot of progress that a lot of people make. It's a big community as well. So if you want to do a uh, latest calculations, so there are a few uh, steps. So usually you will get some kind of hardware. And so this has many resources that you can get. Uh, Joe mentioned there's this US QCD, uh, the latest QCD effort within US. And together there's a, there are some data that machine that's uh, that's putting in uh, uh, doing National Lab in Fermilab, uh, uh, Blue Heaven National Lab in New York, and Justin Lab in Virginia. So there's other computation time that we can write proposal and get some small amount of time that you can uh, play it around with doing some intermediate uh, calculations. There are also nationwide much larger computer that one can get. Uh, so uh, I think Oakridge is still one. I think Titan's probably, this is probably out of date now, but uh, Titan's and Oakridge National Lab, they have this really large cluster, a huge amount of time. Um, uh, there is also a nurse in Berkeley lab. Uh, Harper just retired a couple of years ago, but they have other machine that's coming along. And if you are, so when I was a grad student, I was interested in this calculation that I had to get my own computer resources and I actually built my own something called QCOC at the time, that's early 2000-ish. And so that was at the time they were hoping this new uh, hardware that's going to solve QCD. They was hoping to be a QCD on a chip, but QCD turned out to be more complicated than we think about. So that didn't really solve all the QCDs. And there are also a lot of software available. So you can find this is, I think they will be, that this school will have its own software uh, resources, but there are also a lot of uh, online tutorial. This is one of the old example I did in 2000s, and we have a couple of lectures and packages, but there are a lot more in Europe and in all over the place that you can find a lot of software that come with tutorial, uh, teach you how to use that. So you can take a lot of library people they built and, and then start and stuff on there and build uh, build on top of your own you know, what you are interested in so you don't have to spend a lot of time just kind of checking everything's working right so again the latest is really a, com a lot of community efforts and then the next thing you need might be you need some kind of qcd vacuum right so and this is what we call gauge generation so you remember the qcd is actually moving and dynamics so what we have, what we do is you can imagine like we are taking a snapshot of the QCD pictures. So we will, uh, so to, in order to do the calculation, so we, what we do is kind of we take a snapshot of specific um, Monte Carlo time, then we try to run them again and we take another snapshot. And so the idea would be if you have enough of them, you stack all this together and make like a, if you want to imagine it's like a movie, you kind of stack up like a real movie that you can actually capture the QCD. And this is kind of what we do. Um, so, so then, because this is a very expensive effort, uh, this is probably one of the most expensive part of the latest QCD calculation. And they actually quite a bit of uh, the global community. This is not this is outside the US. This is a, a global community that is an international data latest data grid where people will be sharing this uh, latest because they spend so much time making right, and they do the calculation one, but people might have new ideas, so they will. This is something you can download from internet like everything else in the world. You can download the QCD vacuum and you can play it around with some calculation on them. And they are just a one, this is an older map, but they are multiple hubs. They are probably more now to kind of make sure that the download process, uh, they have big, multiple backup and um, you can download it faster from the local hub. And then there are sometimes when you don't, find the latest you, you want, and it happened to uh, some cases. Uh, 
So when I was a postdoc, I was interested in study something called excited state where I need my uh, time dimension to be different from the other direction. So I had to do kind of do that myself. And if you are interested in you know different flavor or the color flavor or the QCD background that nobody else is uses, and uh, then you had to do that yourself as well. So there are there are some advantage, but then you can also you can use a lot of knowledge that people build up. When they generate the standard DUI or uh, color flavor of QCD, and then you can use that uh, to generate more specified uh, cases you like. Then, once you have the, the QCD, uh, you have the QCD vacuums, then you can start to do some correlators on them. And these correlators actually help you, you can try to extract some of the observable of them. And we're going to do use a little bit of that today as well. And so, so what you need to do here is you take the QCD vacuum. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yes. You take the QCD, you take the QCD vacuum, and as some you so assuming this is a uh, time access, including time access, right? So you create, say I want to study nucleon because that's what I like to do. Um, so you create a nucleon at one specific uh, Euclidean time. And you calculate you with the part you have calculated the propagator, you can combine them in specific um, quantum numbers. So it's a spin one half, it's a baryons. Uh, and then and then I, you can also have a different momentum projection. Say you want to study a static nucleon, and you like the static is a moving nucleon, etc. And you align them at some specific time. And then I can study how how the behavior depends, how the a correlator uh, is a function of time that will help me extracting the masses and other properties. And so, so the analysis you will be doing um, for the next couple of days is actually associated with this. And we are just going to simplify looking in the nuclear myself and then Uh, so at first we're going to uh, look at the gen line today. So you already done some of those for the pre-class, and today you're going to be just learning how to read in the correlators and then make a simple gen line. And then tomorrow's lecture, you'll be doing something called effective mass, which is a a, a way to very nice for you to eyeballing uh, what the mass should be before you do any fitting. And then with the uh, uh, Professor Alban's class uh, next week, I think, uh, you will be able to go, go into a little bit in depth on uh, how do you deal with them and more actual fittings there. Right. So, so here is where you're going to start in the analyze part of the class. But a real latest person, if you are interested in study like this, right? So usually when you have a calculation, that's not actually a true number of what the latest QCD say about this particular quantity. Right, I remember that I say there's a, a lot of parameter that we make assumption with. We have a uh, latest basing, which is the resolutions. You know, we want to make sure that your answer is not changing by this resolution. If it is, then you know you're not actually getting the true answer. We have this latest box, right? You want to make sure your box is big enough so you actually get the, the real answer. We actually can see that when the box is too small compared with your the, the particle you want to study in terms of sizes, you see very strange behavior that had happened before. So this is one of the uh, logo I like to steal from, I think it's 2001-ish, that was before my time, but at Florida, when they have a lot of alligators. So it, I like to use this uh, as a reminder that, so if, even though we spend a lot of effort doing the latest calculation of this four dimension simulation, but you know, you do not care to study it very carefully you are actually not actually getting the true answer. You are getting the, the, the wrong answer that the alligator actually come out and bite you. You can get very wrong answer too. So something had to be very careful. And there are a bunch of semantics that, uh, that one had to be very careful about. I'm not gonna go do too much of this detail. And so just kind of give you a few ideas about, you know, what can you do with the latest as a grad student? Maybe some of you are going to be a grad student, some of you are a grad student right now. Uh, they, are, they are actually quite a lot of interesting um, uh, example that one can do as a grad student. And I, I like to use this example when I was in University of Washington. I worked with Raul a little bit on the, his first latest QCD project. Then we look at the, for example, in this case, we look at the pion and pion scattering with each other, and we look at the scattering length. And so we actually can do much better 
predict uh, calculation. So this is what we did at the time, although we never really get around to publish it. Uh, so you can get really small scaling line compared with what the experiment get. Um, it's very old experiment that people haven't really repeat that. So you can get much more precise calculation than that. And you can also make a lot of predictions, which is really fun for theories. Theories always like to make prediction, you know, before the experiment find them. And so we were looking at something is not too computing uh, demanding at the time. We look at the, the various different type of charm variants. And so we were able to make a bunch of predictions. I like say the three charm variants, they wasn't very hard to calculate on the latest, but there was no prediction at the time. Uh, and then later, the, all the, a lot of this data are being discovered by, uh, confirmed by LHCB. But it was really fun that we actually able to be experiment to, to make some of these predictions. And so, uh, so there are a lot of great opportunity for great students to, to work on and publish paper with, you know, just some of this basic knowledge. And so there are also a lot of other efforts that people are pushing uh, you know, from, for some of the a lot of quantity that we calculate for a long time, like Kayan descent constants and pions, and uh, a lot of effort have been pushing toward uh, much, much more precise uh, calculation. So there you are actually uh, trying to really discern a new physics that you try to narrow down what's the contribution for standard model. Sometimes we use this number as input in some of the beyond standard model models. And sometimes we just use them to compare with different predictions from different models. So you can rule out certain, you know, uh, uh, Susie and other uh, possibilities. So the nucleon would be actually um, also a very interesting frontier to uh, really push it down to that precision. So uh, that's my brief introduction for latest QCD today. Anyone have questions? Okay, uh, so what I want to do. Uh, so then I would like to address a couple of the issues that uh, I'm going to Send this link to everyone, just so that the some of the question asked about the pre-class. I think that's the right link. Okay, so can you still see my screen? I don't know whether I do I share a different screen now. I still share the same PowerPoint screen. Yeah, I can't see your screen. Um, or VN in this case. Um, and if anyone would like to shed light, because I couldn't really uh, figure out, you know, the purpose of your screen is grayed out. Oh, uh, let me see. Yeah, at this point, you're only sharing PowerPoint slides, not the whole screen. Okay. Um, so the, the window is kind of in the weird place. I can see all the menus. Um, let me see, I can do this again. Um, yeah, so if you stop, want to, okay. yeah, there you go. That's, okay. that's working. All right, so I just want to address a couple of the uh, common question that uh, that people are putting in the, the survey. Um, so, so, so there's a, this common, so the, the standard DB, uh, so if you use NumPy, you can use this STD function, we give you the standard deviation. And in, it depends on different programming, give you slightly different, um, uh, this overall factor, one over N or one over N minus one. Uh, but in, in, in the case, like when we are doing the sampling, like because we are sampling the vacuums. And, and so that's actually a slight difference is the overall factor. We actually prefer to use N minus one. So you might see a, a tiny differences there, but it's okay. Once you have a large enough sample, the N and N minus one is small. So I. I will pop, uh, it's probably okay for this summer purpose, uh, summer school purpose here. And then there's an additional thing about this gen line. So we are resampling, uh, we are resampling the, the, the data, right? So you have originally had a, a board border. So if you're plotting the histogram to see the original data would be, if, without doing any gen line, you would be seeing a distribution large border. And when you do gen line, 
because you are averaging a subgroup, right? So you should see that the distribution is narrower, right? So, um, so that's basically give you a visual effect about you know what this gene is doing. It's averaging a subset of data, including a specific subturn. That's that's one way of resampling. You can have other way of resampling, but and so. And then you can you see that the, the distribution is closer because now you're doing a certain averaging, and uh, they are uh, very uh, uh, advantage of doing that. So if you are we are not doing fitting right now, but one of the biggest advantages is probably when you are doing fitting, your data would be originally you would have this big parameter space all over the place, and now because the you have this sub averaging effect, that actually the fitting usually come out with a, a lot more stable when you have the gen app gen knife. And we give you a better error estimation if your data itself is kind of biased and correlated in a way. So that give you a better uh, error estimation as well. On the latest calculation, often you have to combine one correlator with another. And the Gen9 also give you a very nice way to, because you have knowledge of what the other snapshot of the backing was doing in, in some way when you do those average. So there are certain errors that got canceled out that you can actually, uh, that they can use that to work your advantage as well and so i send this to everyone uh, you should see that in the chat and if you have further questions we can discuss that and then finally is the error bar what we mean by errors so there's a i realized that it's actually uh, depends on your subfield everybody probably call errors slightly differently um so here i'm basically trying to specify my once you have the journey list um to unify what everybody is doing. Uh, basically, you are actually calculating the error, the uncertainty to the mean of the distributions. So uh, there's a that's different from certain deviation. There's additional uh, scale factors of that. So at the end, if you are looking at the Gen9 error, once you have Gen9 list, you can use this formula just uh, that cancel out these additional factors over there. Okay. I hope that answers most of the questions. Um, all right, so uh, now I'm going to send everybody the in-class notebook. I realize we don't have much time um, left. Let me see. How do I... I hope you can try to work with each other a little bit. Um, so you can, I also give you a Gen9 function, but you totally free. You don't have to use the same Gen9 function to work with this problem. Okay, let me see what I'm going to do. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. No. Okay. So I'm going to send the in-class notebook to everyone. Um, so I guess uh, given the limited time, maybe uh, it makes sense to, you know, uh, it should be a very similar exercise. Okay. Okay. Got it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so I, I didn't ask, so maybe we can go do that together. Very briefly, just make sure that um, there's no confusion or anything. Uh, let me see, is that the right window? Okay. So, not sure. let's see. Oh, no. Uh, Okay. Uh, can you see the Instagram? Uh, Instagram. Well, your screen is not sharing for us. Okay. <laughs> you might be only sharing um, PowerPoint or whatever you're presenting on, rather than your whole screen. I'm not sure though. Oh, you still did not see it. Okay. Um... Say, so, Doctor Doctor Lin, try not. Like unshare your screen and then try it again. Uh, okay. So let's see. You can either I, share your entire screen or you can share just one application. And if you just share one application, it'll gray out all of the other applications. So you have to share your entire screen if you want all the applications to sh to show. It's so like the first option under share is share. Um... Right. So the problem is, I 
So uh, the first option I have, sh share content, is that right? And it get me to this place, which I, uh, let me see. No, am I on sharing and sharing? I was gonna say, you wanna that do- uh, Yes, we can see everything now. Oh, okay. All right. Um, sorry. Okay. So, uh, so today you will be just, um, so you will be doing very similar and analyzing what you do in the pre-class, but instead of generating random number, now I'm giving a data and I give a little bit of hint about how to bring in the data. And especially if you haven't used Python, you're not familiar with using Python at all. Uh, I give you a few links that you can uh, see how to do this. Now, once you read in, it should be quite straightforward and then uh, how to slice data might be a little bit tricky, depends on um, uh, your familiarity, but there are more than one way of doing that. And then you will see the, the uh, Gen 9 distribution. Uh, you, you, I want you to compare the differences between different time slices, and we, we can discuss that a little bit, what this means physically, uh, if you didn't have a chance to do that within your group. And then we will be basically doing very similar thing, uh, making a Gen 9 uh, effort, et cetera. Um, <coughs> And so uh, we can discuss this a little bit more tomorrow if you do have more problems. Uh, let's see. All right, so let's see. Uh, so you should all got the, you should all receive the, oh, I don't know how to unshare now, okay. Uh, so you should get the, the link from the chat. And then, um, so now we can try to break down and what we each other link is QCD. Um, so like I said before, uh, this, this is going to be free classroom. So I'm not going to talk a lot today. And a lot of this, uh, the, the material design is really to have you to work with each other. So I will go do a few other things today and then we'll have you work with, with each other and then we will check back to the main uh, meeting room. So, um, so let's just quickly talk about uh, the yesterday's in-class assignment. Um, so most, I think most people doesn't have much trouble reading, that's great. Um, so one of the things that bring up in the survey is, you know, why are we looking at this different time differences, right? So from the day one, can you guys see my screen change? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Right, so so one other thing I was uh, asking you guys, so there are different ways of slicing data. I hope everybody had fun doing their own thing. They are uh, multiple ways of doing that. So one other thing I want you to look at is look at the correlator, the histogram normalized correlator at different time slice of the, of the Euclidean time. And so one other thing, you probably see something similar. Uh, you might have a different bin sizes that your histogram might be different. But what you will see is at a smaller time, you see a more closer distribution at larger time, you see that distribution wider up. And this is actually, uh, again, this is an uh, interesting physics, not something you need to dig in immediately, but uh, because the, so that I heard, I, uh, they are a uh, student asking about what does this mean? So what this is, and so when we are generating, remember we are trying, we have a snapshot of the QCD vacuum, then we put quads in this QCD vacuum. But you have to remember that the quads actually can dynamically generate inside the nucleon, uh, inside the vacuum. So you have a lot of complicated loop that going on at the same time. So what we usually do is, if you have, think about this as nucleon, you have three propagators going on, propagating due space time. And if you look at the variance of this particular operator, then you end up with a quad, 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 and then another anti-quad, 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 which is this pink color, uh, Compounds here. Uh, so what you do is uh, because the so you can what we really want is we want the, the nucleon and all the quads to glue together and form a nucleon. But but then the system because you have when you look at the variance you have this anti anti quad propagators and what what system likes to do is a lot of physics like to do is always the system always likes to settle down at the lowest energy possible. And unfortunately, the three quad state is not the lowest energy. It's the pions actually is have lower energy. So you can they like to form this a combination of quad and anti-quad glue together. 
and that form a pion. So one single pion is roughly 140 MeV. A nucleon is 940 MeV. So two nucleons way heavier than three pions combined. And this, therefore, at the larger time, at the larger time, basically you are competing with the, uh, the signals in the Euclidean time. So that's one of the disadvantages of doing latest QCD when you strip everything to Euclidean time. Then you end up with you are competing your nucleon signal with the uh, the pions that you know you don't want them when I want to study nucleon, and you have these noise factors, right? Because nucleon is always is heavier than 1.5 times of the physical pion mass. So you end up with you have you are basically you are knowing your signal is decreasing. Therefore, at larger time, your distribution is getting wider and wider, and that's one of the challenging people are doing. And this does not happen if you replace one of the nucleon to pion. The pion it sells already like this, there's nothing, nobody to compare with. So when you, if you ever have a chance to look at the pion correlator, this does not become a, a significant problem. So, so that's one of the features that you can you know that when you are examining the data, if the state itself is a very young state, then always other made on state in the background that you compete in, then you see the noise getting worse. And if you have a meson correlator, you will behave very differently. So if you are given a random mysterious data somewhere, you know, by examining the time dependence, that tell you a lot more about not just the masses itself, it tell you what kind of particle you might be looking at. There are a lot of property you can study. All right. Uh, any other question about day one? Okay. Then, uh, so with the day two of uh, the yesterday's pre-class assignment, I think that's quite straightforward. Most students uh, have um, uh, are pleased with the progress. And so basically, you just have to do a very simple calculations using this effective mass plot. And this is basically assuming if there is only one state that's dominating, if, it, if I assume my correlator is a single exponential uh, dependence, right? Then you can, you can have, you can look at this so called effective mass. And then you should see something uh, at larger time. Again, everything in the latest QCD is. At an earlier time, at a larger time, when the time is large enough, everything kind of died down, then you see that particular ground state. So, so you have some pseudo data yesterday, then today you will be looking at um, the, the latest data. So I'm just going to go to the day two in class now. Okay, so I send the, I send a link to this notebook on the chat. So you should be uh, all have access to this now and be able to open it. And so, so today, oopsie. Let me sure, make sure I have the right version. I, okay. So today we were just going to take the latest data on that you saw yesterday and you still need the same refunctions, et cetera. And then you have to use the genetic function you wrote yesterday as well. Then I want you to estimate the ground state masses without using the fit. And so the part one is the real the one I want you to focus and, and finish for today. And I want you to start with uh, kind of compare with you're going to uh, work in group again. And And, and I want you to first kind of just make sure that uh, that you you everybody in your group is obtaining the same uh, effective mass. So that's one way that you you can post check with each other. Uh, so that should be uh, straightforward. And I want you to make sure that have, that's all correct before you move on, because if you just going to if you have a mistake in the beginning, you're just going to carry on the same mistake over the place, and we'll be making the debugging really hard later on to find out what's going on. Right. So, and then. And then, so there are a few cost chips there that you want to, you, you've already downloaded the data, you don't have to download again, but you can also download again second time. And what I want you to do to, is to use the function and uh, read, when I say reading in, you basically you, you generate, a, you have a correlator, they are a bunch of numbers, and there's a time dependence there. And then you have, basically it's a long list. And then you have the original correlator list. You want to make a genine uh, list 
uh, we're using similar function you do yesterday. And then you, uh, once you cross check with each other, make sure everybody got the same answer, then you move on and then you can make effective math using the GNI list. And so at the end of the day, I want you to try to use mainly plot to, to make a function and to see what the time dependence look like. And I want you to think about what, what is this, what, what are the data is the, so the data makes sense, right? So a lot of time we look at data by itself, but you also want to know what is the physics meaning beyond that. And so, and then, so you can also estimate the masses without doing the fit using the larger time uh, numbers of your effective mass. And if you have, if you get finish all, uh, finish all this in time, then I want you to think about, so I give you one of the effective mass definition, but in principle, you can have different ones. And I want you guys to kind of talk to each other and maybe come up with different ideas on, you know, how can you come use the same initial assumptions and then come up with a different definition. And if you have time, you can even code it up if you want. And then I have a bunch of extra part two and part three. It's not required, but if you finish the part one too quickly, some, some I don't know, maybe some of you have experienced before, and then you can think about some of the other problems I have later on, but they are not required. Okay, um, any questions so far? Okay, so, uh, oops, sorry, typo here. Um, so then I think then we were just going to go break out in the same group as yesterday. And then I think I will stay in the main room here. And if you have any questions, you can come back to, if you have questions that uh, your group, uh, everybody cannot agree on how to solve them in your group, they can come back here and ask questions or you want to check in with anything. But I like, maybe we can check back, say everybody check back at 2.30 or so. And uh, I would like to, you know, some of you may can show, share some of the results. If you get to the different way of determining the effective mass, um, then I would like to hear um, some of some of your dis discussion or some of your results. So, how to how to do this effective mass function? Okay, so assuming you get to text number three, which is forming twenty. So, so the data you are reading. Uh, let's quickly review what we read. Um, day one. So we have a slightly more complication than the pre-class, the day one pre-class. Right now you have a, a, a list of data that have a time dependent. So you can think about this as two dimensional data, right? You have a time and you have the links, the number that's corresponding to different next shot or the QCD vacuum. So you basically take a measurement on one snake shot to another measurement on snake shot. So you have a bunch of number kind of stitched together. And so, so what you need, but the time dependence is really the physical uh, dependent, uh, uh, components here. So you want to have that, you want to pick up uh, in addition to the list we talked about in the pre-class. Now, uh, in this case, it's 100 over here. Uh, you also have a time component you need to worry about. So you want to pick up, you want to slice all the time equal to zero. You have a 100 list and you apply the gen like this or not to get the new gen like this for t equal to zero. Then repeat the same process. So in day one, I know some people may have missed it. Um, so uh, in the text two, we have we have this exercise, and in principle, you can uh, using the same function uh, that whatever you come up with to slice the time. Uh, I'm using some of the um, the uh, gen line function to slice them. I can just pick up all the first component equal to zero and first component equal to one and two, etc. So, but there are different ways of doing this. So once you have this new 25, 24. So I each time have 100 element and you gen nine them, they still have 100 number inside that gen nine. Now you apply, apply this function. So you take a simple log, um, that what you have, but now each time, each of the time is the gen nine list, right? So now you have a new T say, let's say T equal to zero, right? You start with T equal to zero. Then you have, you take the T equal to one, in the numerator and then t equal to zero in the denominator and take a log function. Then you have a new, you have 100 number that corresponding to uh, effective mass gen nine numbers, right? Then now you repeat, you iterate over time, then you have up to 
you can only run to 23 because you only have 24 total time. So now you have 23 of this number. Then you take the then you can take the mean and error for the effective mass. So you have end up with 23 mean and 23 arrows that later you can make plot with. Does that clarify the question? Let me find the chat window. <laughs> okay, so so uh, so this is a uh, so even though this is kind of uh, simple and, and introductory, but we actually use this quite a lot in basically any data taking. Um, that we do, uh, we, we do this a lot, and it's really useful to check uh, some of your what your data look like and whether whether they behave what you supposed to behave. So I showed this uh, plot yesterday. I just want to emphasize that you know a lot of time um, it's even though we so in the next week's class you you probably have a chance to do this again hopefully, and so they, then often is when we fit the correlators. But a lot of time, befitting have actually a lot more complicated procedures, right? So you have to think about what's the range you are fitting, what are the data you look like, and uh, this is slightly different data than what you would be, uh, what you're using. But they have very similar feature. You're not going to see, you know, in the ideal world, if you have completely flat, uh, on the whole correlator is dominated by one state only. Then you should see something that's completely flat. But it's really hard to to do that because when you put in what you you don't really have a control in that microscopic of what the 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 quads and gluons are doing right. So I want I know what I want. I create the operator. I design them right, and then I have I want specific quantum numbers right. But but that that particular operator can also overlap with a higher excited radiating excited state also have the same quantum number but higher masses and so 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 very practically what you will see is something like this if you make effective mass plot which should be something similar behavior other than it might be a little bit of weird boundary effect in the initial time but you see something dropping and something approaching to large your time and ish and so the earlier this curvature basically tell me that that one state assumption is bad, right? Because if that's good, you should see something flat. And then one state assumption is good when you have, if you get to large enough time. And you can actually also understand this from the time dependence behavior, right? So we are looking at something, what we, this is what we call A in our exercise. You have some overall factors. And um, then you have some exponential components, and you have the energy, and you have the Euclidean time dependence layer, right? So you can imagine that the, if you have a larger masses of energy, then you, your exponential term will get really slow. So it t equal to zero, everybody contribute the same, right? And this whole exponential is one. So everybody start in the same fair point. And then it is the heavier mass is going to decay faster, and the ground state going to decay slower, and eventually. You know, all your scientists they will die out a larger time because this is getting too small, sometimes smaller than machine precision, you don't even pick up. And then the ground state dominate. So this is great for somebody who wants to study ground state. Uh, I, I study a lot of ground state uh, nucleon, for example, because it's abandoned in the nature world and we do a lot of experiment with them. And not all, everything we touch and precision experiments, etc., they all have certain property with that. So that's good. But there are also a lot of rich physics that um, that uh, people try to find out. You know, we know we, we know the quantum gluon can make this nice stable state that make our matter and us, et cetera. But there are also people try to study what are the exotic case. You know, we really want to test the QCD and what else can QCD do? What kind of other state can QCD do? And that often require you to study much, much higher state. and then. Like this is QCD become kind of complicated to do that because this is exponential factors, right? So, so this is kind of interesting. It's a simple exercise, but there's actually a lot of, of things going on, and obviously uh, a lot of more complicated societies. Spectroscopy itself could be someone else's four or five thesis and still ongoing research and very active in that direction. So there are some advantage. So like every theoretical tool, you have some advantage of 
uh, doing certain study that could be bad for some of the physics you want to do. And one, and there are a lot of creative ways to try to overcome those problems, et cetera, here and there. So, so that's something I, I want to mention. And so we, we, you have another class coming up. Uh, I just want to quickly mention that. So even though I give you a particular uh, effective, state, uh, uh, effective mass formula, right, similar to this one, but there's actually, uh, you can do, uh, there are different ways of doing this. For example, you can form a symmetrized version of the excited state. You can try to derive this yourself using simple, sim simpler. Um, you can expand this in different terms and try to treat it as algebra problems and you can solve the masses, assuming you know this assumption is correct, then you can actually derive uh, various different forms. You can do symmetry, you can vary the time. And right now I'm varying the time by one time slices, but you can vary them in different time slices as well. There's no, no um, really, uh, there's really no one way of getting out a mass from this very simple time series. And so this is, uh, there are people doing that as well. And then if you want to go really exotic, exotic about this, you know, if you have that energy, you can expand them, say, now I'm going to assume they are two, uh, if, if you see a very sharp, a very steep uh, slow coming on your beta mass plot, that means the excited state is there in the earlier time. And you could, you know, again, you can try to derive this, assuming your whole correlator have two states, and you can have four, basically have four parameters, A, two A's, and two energy, and you can basically derive you can try to write down, say, four, you need at least four data input to be able to solve these four parameter problems. Then you can come up with really crazy one. You can even have a excited state effect mass, et cetera. So this is not something people do, but I, I find out about this when I was playing around as a great student, I find this is really interesting. Um, so, but, but yeah, in principle that you can probably expanding this. The problem is like I say, the excited state is not, not something that uh, the Guang State QCD in favor, and we always pick up a lot more signal for the excited state, uh, for the Guang State, and excited to die up really quickly. So people had to do special trick, right? So one thing you can do is you can make your time component very, very small. You made the time much smaller, higher uh, than the spatial time. And then, so maybe you can pick up a signal really before the whole, whole thing dies out very quickly. And there's also a way to, you can, you can design special operators somehow only prefer high energy state, but not the lower ones. And they were, they were a bunch of people doing that as well. Okay, um, I hope you have a chance to go back and maybe finish this, but if you have any more questions, um, or you'd like, um, I will be here until three o'clock. Um, 